this morning we're going to turn to God's word again. So continue to Amos chapter 2 verse 6 through 16. And uh, I'll be reading it right up front. Uh, so if you want to turn in your Bibles, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Um, though there is some translations from the King James Version, uh, although not that accurate, but certainly the editors had a, a really good choice to bring out the sense of the scripture. So Amos chapter 2, picking up at verse 6. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted, a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars, and who was as strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above his roots, above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you forty years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. Behold, I will press you down in your place as a cart full of sheaves presses down. A flood shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the mighty save his life. He who handles the bow shall not stand, and he who is swift of foot shall not save himself, nor shall he who rides the horse save his life. And he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. We now come to a point that is at the very centre of God's judgments. Amos has crisscrossed over Israel and Judah and spiralled at the same time. It's just like, a, like an eagle or a hawk spiralling with his eyes set on his prey. Six nations, Judah, and now Israel. And in fact, from here on till the end, seven and a half chapters, I think, Israel, you're in trouble. Of those nations, the pagan nations, uh, three nations were far removed from Judah, Israel, Syria, Philistia, and Tyre. They were, they were distant. They were pagans from, from a distance, if you like. While another three, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, they were cousins, second cousins, if you like, to Israel and Judah. And of course, Judah was a brother, if you like, to Israel, to the tribes of Israel. We don't know the effects upon Israel from the separation except from that which we see in Scripture and learn how they lived their lives after the separation. Some commentators suggest that Israel would have thought that with Judah the prophecies of Amos had come to an end. Well, Judah's been judged. That's great. And then suddenly it was their turn. On the other hand, they might have been hearing the words of Amos and they'd have felt and seen that God is slowly squeezing in 
until judgments are definitely coming their way and they came their way as the word of Amos is to Israel however what might have been of significance is that now out of seven nations God has pronounced judgment over them and if you think of Jewish thinking the number seven is perfect the number seven is completion the number seven is fulfillment they might well have thought well God's punishment is fulfilled in those seven nations Judah and six pagan nations and so they would have relaxed but in fact all seven add up to the perfect punishment for Israel but this was not just about Israel this was about Judah Judah's received their punishment but Judah are neighbors they're brothers and now they see God's words towards Israel what a warning to them and to the church today we should be asking ourselves a question what can we learn from what is happening in these nations and what has happened in Judah and certainly now especially what is happening in Israel as we will learn going forward just a brief background and you know this but I want to remind you and put it into context back in the days of Noah and his son Shem and then Terah whose son was Abraham then Isaac and then Jacob and Jacob the last of this promised line Isaac uh, Abraham Isaac and Jacob before uh, Jacob encounters God and that's important in Genesis 32 22 to 27 explains this occurrence whereby Jacob wrestles with a man some suggest it was an angel some say no it was a man I tend to think it was an angel and as Jacob wrestles with this angel that appears to him as a man and this encounter is in a sense in the presence of God in under the eyes of God for such messengers are directly from God so finally his name is changed from that from of Jacob to that of Israel the negative side of this is that some suggest that Jacob struggled with God as a negative thing and that might be so but there's a complementary striving not a resisting of God but a striving with God to know God to know his mind to know his nature to know his will to know what he desires from us and I have a sense that this was more of a striving rather than a resisting he resisted the man as he wanted to overpower him but he was not resisting God and we see immediately afterwards he does not resist God he takes God's judgment on him that of the ball of his hip which is to be uh, the sinew is to be shortened and he would walk with a limp for the rest of his life the limp was to remind him you've encountered God you know we we live in a day where uh, live your best life now I want to ask that man where is your limp from encountering God for encountering God there are times when we are, are affected by sin by selfishness selfishness and by all kinds of pride and to encounter God in that state will produce a limp in our lives not necessarily of the hip but I want to ask those people who constantly promote Christians as having this best life now where is your limp when did you encounter God in that way and so we see the beginning of the 12 tribes comes from an encounter with God and this wonderful potential of these 12 tribes finds him at some stage in Egypt where they become the slaves of the Egyptians for close on 430 years and God in his mercy and by his grace delivers them and, and in delivering them they spent 40 years and I want to turn it in this way 40 years of being set apart 
before crossing the Jordan and entering the promised land and there to set up a kingdom under God. Yet biblical history shows us that at that time of entering the land there was a, there was a separation between the tribes. Not the separation under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Even before, if you read the history and read scripture, you will discover there was a tension within the twelve tribes. Now Ephraim, a son of Joseph, becomes the dominant tribe in the northern kingdom. Nearly a third of all those ten tribes is the lands of Ephraim. If you look at a map showing uh, post the division of the two uh, of north and south, you will see Ephraim fills a huge part of Israel, the northern kingdom. Uh, and, and it's the same Ephraim which is later to become Samaria, the Samaritans, so despised by the Judeans in Judah. It becomes a little clearer after Saul's death. And David becomes king. Remember, under the period of the judges, there was no united kingdom. Every tribe had their own judges. There were 12 tribes coexisting with each other. But of course, they did what they wanted to do, and then they wanted a king like other nations, and so God gives them a king. And what the king's purpose was to unite these tribes, but there was still tribal dissatisfaction amongst them. For some lands were more than others, and you even find Dan, who, who is in the southern kingdom, migrates to the north. They were couched between Manasseh and uh, Judah, and, and I think it was Benjamin and Judah. Uh, they had the Philistines on the one side, but they got so far north that they were exposed to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians, and, and so they were always the first tribe to be hammered later on. So there's this tension. And Solomon, the king, and under David, those tensions are moved a bit, and, and there's a bit of a, a uniting factor. So under David there's somewhat of a unity, but we even see David coming, becoming king, there's an issue. Remember, uh, I think uh, Saul, uh, Solomon, Saul rather, was of the tribe of Benjamin. But David is now of the tribe of Judah. And, and so Solomon is of the tribe of Judah, is the tenth son of David. So, so David unites the kingdom. Uh, Solomon goes about setting a precedent that will soon divide the kingdom, not under his rule, but soon. So there's never complete satisfaction in these ten tribes. Don't kid yourself that Israel was ever truly united. That's not historically accurate, and it's not biblically accurate. They were tribal. They were at each other's throats. And even when the, the northern kingdom separates and they're ten tribes, they still are at each other. Manasseh becomes stronger and stronger and just abuses his, his brothers, so to speak. But soon as Solomon dies, the taxes that he had demanded upon his people, they come to him and say, well, what, Rehoboam, uh, you know, your father, Solomon, put such uh, pressure on us uh, to pay these taxes. Uh, won't you give us some reprieve? And he says, well, if whatever he did, I will do it even worse. And eventually the kingdom divides. <coughs> to continue with another man's policies is often a foolish thing. And what follows is the most important to our text today. Jeroboam, who seems like the righteous one, separates. Rehoboam seems like the cad, the bad guy. But if you see what happens in time, the northern kingdom, not one godly king, at least there were a couple in the south, in Judah, they become godless kings. And the basis is that when Jeroboam separates, an often undervalued issue, is he sets up his own religion. Believe me when I say this, Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, were not Jewish in religion. 
They set up their own altars in Dan and Bethel. They appoint their own priesthood. There's no Levites there. They appoint their own feast days. And here in Amos, you'll see how moving away from the true identity people should have in God, as Judah had, but Israel forsook. So with the Christian, if we forsake our identity, our biblical Christian identity, we're in grave danger as Israel were. And so it came to the point where they were harshly judged. I've mentioned Dan, how they had left the south and gone to the north. Um, and so Dan, instead of being uh, east of, of, of uh, west of Jerusalem, moved to the north, east of Tyre. The whole length of the United Kingdom, if you like, they've gone from the south to the north. They rejected the southern tribes. And now we come to Amos, 160 plus, some say about 176, but I would correct that to say it's closer to 160 years where they come in. Um, Obadiah, by the way, prophesied of the, the success of Jeroboam II. Didn't, doesn't mention his name. But that Israel would become really wealthy and strong and, and powerful. And, and that's exactly what happens. You would think this nation that has moved away from true worship of God with their own altars and their own worship style and their own things. You'd think because they'd moved away, God would punish them then. No, God leaves them. The scripture says, for God will long look at your sin. He, and then there comes a day, and I love what the, the, I think it's in Psalms or Proverbs says, but I can no longer wink. That doesn't mean one eye, by the way. It means both eyes. I can no longer close my eyes at your sin. And so it happens with Israel. They've reached the point where God can no longer close his eyes to their sin. And so Israel goes down the road of their own devised worship. We forget that in history. They had their own feast days. But Judah, because they have the Levites in the temple and the Ark of the Covenant and the they hold on to the, the Torah. In fact, you might not know this. There's two Torahs. There's those who live in what is what used to be Samaria. And they say they have the Sumerian Torah. And that's the true one. And those that the, down south in Judah had, no, that was the false one. Have you had people tell you? Well, our Bible is the only one. There's danger written on there, isn't there? So, finishing with my introduction, <laughs> the next seven points will be clear. <coughs> you told on me, Eddie. It was really unfair. I didn't want them to start getting shifty in their seats before it even started. And so the first thing we find is that Israel have a predisposition towards injustice. Remember last week the courtroom setting? Like the judge comes in and the bailiff says, all rise. I don't know if that's what they say in America, but in South Africa it would be probably a court orderly, we'd call him, probably a policeman, and he would say, or a clerk of the court, and he would say, all rise, and uh, something I would refuse to do is the advocates or the lawyers would bow to the magistrate or the judge coming in. I think it's shocking. Here we have a slightly different wording. Thus saith the Lord, the courtroom is in procession. And Judah, in, in the previous one, was on the stand. Now it's your turn, Israel. You're on the stand of the accused. And from verse 6, we see the because. Because, and then the phrases that follow, right up to verse 12. But I'm just going to do the first part um, up to verse 8 at first. 
And there are three main, uh, three main charges against Israel. The first one is that of social injustice. Well, it's quite a popular word today, isn't it? But it's been around a long time. The second one is sexual immorality. Nothing new there. And the third one is idolatry. And you'll see from the middle of verse 6 to the middle of verse 7, two important elements at play here. Picking up in the middle of verse 6, Because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals, those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, and turn aside the way of the afflicted. Some commentaries suggest this is about slavery. This is not about slavery. We've seen slavery, and it might have a, a slight connotation towards slavery. There's a far more, a far worse issue at hand here. The scene is another courtroom, okay? And in this courtroom, the righteous man stands in the dock and he will plead his case and win his case except the judge has been bribed. The righteous, understand the courtroom setting, the righteous, because they are sold, as it were, for silver. This is not slavery. And the needy for a pair of sandals. So in this courtroom setting is that there's corruption and injustice. It's a warning to every nation in the world. When your court system, your justice system becomes corrupt, God will judge those nations. Believe me. That's what I see in scripture. So the judges are being bribed and the righteous are being found guilty. And this was commonplace. This is not just an odd situation. As a result, this system favors the rich and not the righteous. Not to say that the righteous aren't maybe rich, but they're going to be rich enough and probably aren't. And look at it courts today. If you have to go to court today, what do they say? It's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, probably by now it's another arm and a leg as well. Amos draws atten our attention to the poor. And this might relate to several things. Either the poor being sold off for a pair of shoes. And, and the implication could well be. Now a pair of shoes, I should imagine this is a pretty good pair of shoes. Could be a year's income for a poor and needy man. And he comes in to the witness box to testify on behalf of the righteous man. Just take these pair of shoes and testify against him. For a poor man a pair of shoes in a day where you only traveled by foot was your livelihood it was everything you had. You couldn't work without shoes. You couldn't get there. You couldn't travel. You could do nothing without shoes. He has a pair of shoes. Testify against the righteous. In other words, the system is so corrupt. You know, I love it. I sometimes watch, uh, you know, these detective stories or something, and you hear of this guy who um, they get into a corner and say, you know what? If you turn against this guy, we'll give you a lesser sentence. Is that any difference? That is the most corrupt thing I've ever heard of. And I was in the police. I saw it happen in South Africa. If you'll just testify against that guy, we'll give you the lesser charge. That's a corrupt system. It's unrighteous. Verse 7 in the King James Version speaks of them panting after the dust of the poor. And it's such a difficult word in the Hebrew. Um, I, I read I, quite a bit trying to decipher what everyone said, and I'm still not too clear on it, but what I've gleaned from it is this. Panting is like lusting. They are lusting. And there are two thoughts here. One is that they lust so much, they will even take the dust from the poor. And it's an idiot. 
in, in, the, in the Middle East to take so much from someone they don't even have dust left. But on the other hand, and, and this is what I favour, is they will grind the poor into the dust. They will smear, the, and I think this contemporary English version says, they will smear the poor into dust. That's the court system in Israel. That's the justice you get in Israel if you attempt to speak out or attempt to, to stand against the court system. You'll be driven into the dust. Does that sound familiar to our day? There are so many truths in this passage in the days of Amos that are just becoming more relevant and prevalent in our day. All of their wealth in Israel and all of their power, and I'm generalizing, was attained through denying justice. More to the point, by perverting justice. And hey, we found the answer. That is social injustice. Not on this level of the common man, but when your governing systems are so corrupt that it is unjust from beginning to end, that's the social injustice people should be protesting against. Peacefully, that is. The rich and powerful have perverted justice in Israel. Notice these set of crimes seem totally different from Judah and all the six nations we've spoken about. But it boils down to something very similar. Crimes against humanity. Whether you sell someone into slavery or you falsely accuse them that they go into jail, like slavery, what's the difference? And many would be found guilty of a debt or a crime had the option of saying, well, I've, I've committed a crime. Who can I pick on this morning? I'll pick on Bill. I've really committed a bad crime against Bill. And Bill says, well, you can work off your debt by becoming my slave for six months. I hope not. Cool. It could be tough. He's building at the moment, so I could be in trouble. And after six months, you're dead free. Well, the courts would trap people like slaves into these situations. Now I want to just go off a little bit of a trail for a moment. Western society became strong, not on capitalism, not on economy. I believe it became strong on its judo Christian justice system. Where fair was fair. And if you did wrong, you went to jail. But what's happened to our judo Christian, and I'm talking the West, I'm not talking the States only, but Canada, South Africa, England, so many different of your your especially your Anglophile nations, but so many nations were founded on a strong Judeo Christian legal system. And that has been perverted. Judges are bought off, paid off. Witnesses coerced and paid off to, to testify. While the poor struggle to fight back simply because they're overwhelmed with costs or the challenge of trying to fight these things in court. Even sometimes settlements are made. And in terms of wealth, I could go to court and let's say I win five million dollar settlement. Think of any big corporate company, maybe where you shop, or where you don't shop, or bank. That's small change to them. So they buy you off. And Israel was doing that, and the West is, has not learned from Israel. We are following the same 
part as Israel being unjust from top to bottom in, in a justice system and, and more. So I come to the second point, which is one of seven. And that's a per, per, perversion of true worship. Now, you might think immediately in verse 7, halfway through verse 7, but this is not about worship. This is about immorality. And it is. But I want you to follow very closely to what I'm going to say. So we see initially this adultery. A man and his father involved sexually with the same girl. On the one hand, it's adultery. And secondly, it's just plain perverse, isn't it? It appears that the strange perversion is linked religiously. And I will get to that in a while. Now remember, 160 years uh, after the split of Israel and Judah, Israel have reached the place where they reject the word of God. They don't support the word of God. They reject God's rules and laws regarding worship, dietary laws, and moral laws. They've changed everything. You know, just like today, people rewrite history. And then once it's gone, it's gone. And so they developed their own Torah, the one that became the Sumerian Torah. But notice a term that is closely linked to this action of father and son having the same girl. It says there, so that my holy name is profaned. Now, how is adultery profaning the name of God besides breaking the Ten Commandments? It's not what Amos says. He said, you haven't broken the Ten Commandments. No, what he says is, you have profaned the holy name of God. So we have this religious system, which I could spend a long time on. But that's four points, so I, I'll actually leave it out today. And some commentators have suggested, based on the structure of the terms that Amos uses, Israel knew what they were doing. This wasn't just one father and son that did this. This was a common thing in Israel. Now, what father and son would just kind of do that kind of thing unless there was a hook? What is the hook? It's the fertility goddess that was worshipped in Israel at that time. It came from the other nations. The hook is that this was religiously done or for religious. That's why it profanes the name of God. Because you go on. Look at verse 8. This is really shocking stuff. They lay themselves down. Who's them? Father, son and girl. They lay themselves down beside every altar. Not just the old one. Every altar. Now one father, son and girl can't be at, alongside every altar. There had to be a whole lot of other people. Every altar on garments taken in pledge and in the house of their God they drink the wine of those who have been fined. This is so awful that this religious system that had left the word of God that had gone away from the laws of God the moral laws the, the, the um, ceremonial laws and the dietary laws everything they threw out they are now committing acts of adultery in the, in the, at the altar of God and we'll see even in the house of God. If you want to turn to Exodus 22 verse 25. I think it's important to turn there if you, if you want to. While you're turning there, I just want to mention that this garment that is, we find there is taken as a pledge. So remember I said the slave system? Well, there was... If you didn't have too much of a debt, um, who can I pick on this time? I'm going to pick on Billy. Now, um, Billy owes me some money, just a little bit. And I go to Billy and say, well, I know you're going to pay me tomorrow, but I only know that in what I think, so you need to give me something. You know, Billy takes off his nice jacket, I don't know, Armani or something. And he gives me his fancy jacket and says, well, you hold on to my jacket. When I pay you, 
I'll give you a jacket back. We do it all the time, don't we? We have, we have shops where you take in your stuff and they will say, okay, we'll put 10% on and whatever. And that probably would be, but you couldn't, you had to avoid usury. That was a warning to them. And then Billy pays me and he says, where's my jacket? Ah, you'll get it tomorrow, Billy. And I keep it for an extra day or two. But it's cold. And Billy goes home. He's got no, nothing to warm himself with. And he gets cold. This is kind of what this is saying. That these people are so unjust that when someone pays them back, they don't give them their pledge. They don't give them what they had asked for as a pledge. And so, coming to Exodus 22, don't charge interest when you lend money to any of my people who are in need. Before sunset, you must return any coat taken as security of a loan. Because that is the only cover the poor have when they sleep at night. I, I'm, I'm sorry you're so poor, Billy, but... Do you see what the text is saying? They don't care about the poor. They only care about themselves. You can freeze tonight. I don't care. And so when a man who is condemned is unable to, to meet his debt, he, he gives something of value, a coat or garment, but it's not returned to him in the right way. And then the idea of a condemned man who is unable to uh, enjoy the fruits of his of his life maybe or whatever it might be he can't even get to drink his own wine because he's condemned he's either in jail or he's died or whatever it might be they'll just take his wine and drink it now wine was of much value in those days and so they commit acts of uh, injustice they commit acts of idolatry and acts of adultery Just like in Judah, the altar would be consecrated by the priest with wine and with water and with fire. They are consecrating their altars with adultery or immorality, with perversion of justice, and just no regard for the word of God. We see that it was in the house of their God. Notice Amos says, not Yahweh. It's, it's a generic term. It's not Yahweh here. It's in the house of their God. Already Amos is saying, <laughs> listen, I come from the north, uh, from the south. And these people in the north, they don't truly really worship God. And so, I need to start winding up and see a picture a profile of rejecting grace. I'm going to move through verses 9 to 12. I'm just going to read them briefly again. Yet it was, or maybe, yeah. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, who was as strong as the oaks, who destroyed his fruit above and, and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised you uh, up sons for prophets and some of your young men to be Nazarites. Is it not indeed so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. What we have here is Amos saying to Israel, You have rejected God's grace. God has shown you grace. And when you reject God's grace, you reject God's word. When you reject God's word, you reject God. That's the implied truth here. Now, there's a, a biblical scholar, I think, somewhere in the States, Mark Hamilton, quite a young man, by academic standards anyway. And he's done some work on this passage, and he says, in this passage, though, I think, in the King James Version of the American Standard, I in God's term as I in the first person only appears three times but in fact in the Hebrew it appears seven times so it might appear four times in the English standard so when he says I destroyed the Amorites I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath 
I who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. There's further eyes. And I raised uh, of your sons for prophets. And so there's several other places where the I in the first person referencing God appears. So the passage is just a, 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 an inundation of God saying, I have done it. I'm the one that's made covenant. I'm the one that's brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that's brought you through uh, the wilderness. I'm the one that took you across Canaan. I'm the one that defeated your enemies. I'm the one that brought you into this land of milk and honey. I have never broken covenant with you. That's the implied aspect of that text. I have never broken covenant with you. And yeah, Eddie, that's a rhetorical question. I have never broken covenant with you. And the answer is, but you have. Israel, you have. You've broken covenant. You've wandered from God's word. You've wandered from the things I've given you for your safety and security. And you've wandered from my love. You've wandered from my justice. And we, we even find a term, you shall not, in, in that passage. And it's the same term as, as, as at Sinai, thou shalt not. It's a strong word, uh, in both in Exodus and Deuteronomy, and we find it here. But what have they done? Say, thou shalt not speak. Your prophets, thou shalt not speak. I forbid you. You are shut down, and your Nazarites I will make drunk with wine. They have no respect for even those who might call themselves prophets raised by God. They come to, to, to the king and say, listen, king, we better get back on track. And his answer is simply, shut up. Keep quiet. Keep quiet. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And you know, isn't that true? Remember children? Your children, maybe. Maybe someone else's children. And they're getting a moaning at. You must stop doing that. Don't want to hear. That's Israel. They are childish. They're immature in, in, in the things of God because they don't know God's word. They don't know God's law. They've wandered from God's justice. They've wandered from everything God has given them. The grace of God they have rejected. Again, this idea of the Nazarites being drinking wine the implication in the Hebrews that they were made to be drunk and profane the temple where they were so what do we learn from Israel this this is a terrible story and listen if you if you're a bit worried about me going on a bit today I've got another five six seven weeks of it now I'm joking what are we to do with Amos and Israel? I want to say this. It's a warning to us. We cannot reject any part of God's word. You see, you reject one little part, it's a thin edge of the wedge. I like it, it kind of rhymes. Eh? And, and so the wedge just opens up the gap and then it's to reject some other part of God's word. So for Israel, first was rejection of the law. And then, if that isn't so bad, the church today, if we consider it, um, one writer said this, and I just thought it was very profound. He says, that means we stop twisting scripture to suit what we wanted to say, so that our theology will not be pressured. The church today has laid down at the altar with another's garments and been adulterous with foreign beliefs. We brought in foreign beliefs into our theology, into our understanding. And so we ought to be diligent with Scripture. We need to be sure that we're interpreting what we read correctly. Um, there's a danger that we just follow in another person's mistakes because they sound good or they seem to be good. We need to learn to to read the scriptures for ourselves in, in an intelligent and wise way. And the church, and here it falls on each one of us. I'll read what Chan said on this. Not my favorite preacher, but he said something very interesting. 
says the church is in danger because we woo or cozy up to worldly influence in our understanding of scripture and I want to say and that flows into our worship and that's the second most important thing I want to close with not only must we be faithful to the scriptures and be wise with the scriptures but we need to understand what true worship is Israel these were the children of God these were the tribes of God that God had called they went their own way they built their own altars they had their own priests they had their own feast days they went way off course so they worshipped one writer said their worship was perjured kind of can't explain the term really but it's a, it's a nice term their, their worship was false their worship was a lie before God they're standing before God they're calling him God and they say we worship you but their worship is a lie and it's, I think it's such an indictment to the church today that we do not worship God as a lie that we worship God according to scripture according to the truth of God's word another writer said we sell our souls to an unjust system based on corruption and power and so we sanction behavior that is not from God true social justice stems from true worship and fidelity to his word let us as a church be sure that we know what we are doing Israel knew what they were doing and they purposefully went astray they chose to go that way so I encourage you in this day when you go home and you read a passage of scripture read it and read it and read it don't always rely on someone else to interpret it go to a good commentary maybe word by word commentary not a portion by portion go to if you've got eSword I encourage you to get eSword and it's a wonderful tool you can go and see the Greek and you can see the Hebrew and, and it's all there we have so many tools at our fingertips I want to encourage you faithful to the word and true in worship